So let me talk about this here. A couple of weeks ago, I dealt with the alcoholic spirit, you know, like um, should Christians drink alcohol, something like that. And a question was raised, you know, the bullseye question. Did Jesus turn water into wine? Now, I dealt with it sufficiently, yet I was not satisfied. And so when I went walking on the Thursday and the Friday, I was like, I'm, I'm missing something. I'm missing something. There's something that I'm missing that I need to share with the people. And maybe I'm thinking too hard because I was really thinking, what's the, what's the key? So actually, I went up Mother Russell, that's my mom, went up my mama's house and my daddy's house, everybody's house, went up there. <laughs> and um, she said that the Lord had really awakened her up and revealed something. Now, I, I can't remember the quote. Can you remember how you told me that? Come up here quick. Just give, me a, give, them, a, give them the gist of what. So I'm trying to figure it out. I'm figure, trying to walk it out. What's, what's the answer? So I go up, and Mother Russell, come over this way, says what? Yes, uh, as I began to awaken the next morning, directly after the teaching, you know, as you, there is a close walk with God. There really is. Um, he said, you don't think I would have disobeyed my mama, would you? Just as quick as that. I said, huh? He said, yeah, that was my mama. He said, I was first of all obeying her. But of course, you know, what I do is always the best. He said, and of course, when I would have turned the water, it had to be the best, couldn't be nothing. He said, and guess what? Nobody gets drunk off of my wine as quick as that. And I started to smile. And he's just, I, I could really feel God's presence smiling at me, you know, as if to say, you silly girl. Is that, that's yeah. That's and that was probably God's message to me, you silly girl. Um, she said enough, Mother Russell said enough that I went, I know what I have to teach. She didn't say it spot on, but God knew to have her to say a couple of words that I was like, yes. So here I was struggling, struggling. And as usual, when you rest and sleep and be peaceful about it, he brings the answer. So with that in mind, I said, well, the next time that I meet with God's people, I am going to go and deal with that exact topic. Did Jesus turn water into wine? What I think is also interesting is that we are used to looking at the scripture from a certain angle, a certain perspective. And it's almost like God took me through the back door and said, there's the answer. So I look forward to sharing this right now with you, and I pray for God's guidance and understanding. The question is that we're dealing with tonight, did Jesus turn water into wine? And of course, we are absolutely dealing with that first miracle, the wedding at Cain of Galilee, where he turned water into wine. So, I begin. Now, tonight I want to take my time here and reveal to you what I believe is a mystery of this passage of Scripture. In so doing, I will be clear as to why Jesus would not have turned water into an alcoholic beverage. Let me say that Jesus could have done so, for Jesus can do anything. Jesus can do the impossible. Yet I'm telling you that Jesus would not have done so, and I will support it with logical, theological thinking and scriptural support. Now, in order to judge a person's actions, you look at the character of that person. If you hear ill about a certain person, you don't believe it because you know that person and with all that you know, that person has never behaved in that way, right? Now, let's talk about Jesus, because we want to know who is this character? Who is he, right? Now, we are here in the book of John. We're in John chapter 2. So let's visit John chapter 1 and read about who Jesus is. God is so strategic with everything that he does. He could have gave us the miracle in chapter 1. But he needed to establish something and reiterate it in chapter 1, who we are dealing with, who was at the wedding. So John 1, 1 through 5, it says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So God establishes church in John chapter 1, who will be performing the first recorded miracle of the New Testament. He's establishing it. This is who is here. It is Jesus. Jesus was in the beginning. Jesus spoke forth creation. Jesus made everything. Now let's take a look at what is inside of Jesus, according to the scripture. One, life. Two, light of man. That's what the scripture just told us in John 1, 1 through 5. That inside of Jesus, you will see life and you will see light of man. That's all that's inside of Jesus. Light of man and life. Now point to note that the light must shine forth in dark places. The light does not become the dark place. The light shows up in the dark. You and I cannot become the world. We must show up in the world and show forth Jesus. Now I reiterate that Jesus is life and light. You got to see it. Take a look at this picture here. Outline of a man. This man's Jesus. Right? Thank God he ain't black or white. He's Jesus. <laughs> but notice that I have written that all that is in him is good. All that is in Jesus is goodness. That means that all that he is capable of giving out is that which is right. You can only give that which is within you. If it's not in you, you can't give it. All right. So this is what you must see when you see Jesus or think of Jesus. Goodness, 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 goodness. Jesus is full of good. Let me read something here. Colossians 1, 15 through 19. It's about Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. As he is before all things and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So right there, you got to understand, Jesus is full of the Godhead. What did I just say? Jesus is full. That's right. Jesus is full of God. Jesus is full of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because they're all one. And so they are reflections or they are the essence of each other. That's why Jesus could say, when you hear me speak, you hear the Father speak. That's why Jesus could say, look, except the Father tell me, I'm not going to say it. So when Jesus speaks, you can say that's God speaking. At the word of Jesus is as the word of the Holy Ghost, as the word of God. Now Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. And he is talking about who Jesus is. Jesus is the image of God, existed before anything. The, he is the fullness of God. The image of God, existed before anything, is the fullness of God. I'm going to tell you again, that means God, Jesus is all good. Okay. If Jesus is the totality or fullness of God, then we should check out who God is and actually who God is not. Because again, when we look at Jesus, 
We are looking at who God is. And when we know who God is, we know who Jesus is. Because we got to deal with this. You know, if I, let, let me say this, just, just to even bring it more up to speed. I'm asking tonight and dealing with the question, did Jesus turn water into wine? The question could also be, did God turn water into wine? Or it could be, did the Holy Ghost turn water into wine? Because again, they are one. And what one does is at the uh, degree that all three are in agreement. Ain't no fight between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what one does, the other is the same. So God, let's talk about who he is. John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Psalms 4, 5, for thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell in thee. You see that? You see, I want to stop there. Because I'm trying to, I, I, some of you are catching it, I can tell. No evil dwells in God. So that means no evil dwells in the Holy Ghost. Which means no evil dwells in Jesus. Okay, let me ask this question. Does evil dwell in alcohol or the results of it? Of course it does. Alcohol. Rum. Vodka. Church, we've got to understand, we don't have, watch this, we don't have to know the evil of the world, you know. All we need to do is know the goodness of God. Because if we do the good thing, we will yield to the evil thing. No evil dwells with thee, God, no evil. So therefore, God is not going to give people evil. God don't make you sin, because there's no sin in him. How many of you know people drink alcohol, wine, get drunk, get tipsy, and sin? Okay. Let me read on some more. Psalms 92, 15. To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Get that. There is no, let's do it again, because I got to make sure my people are getting the understanding. There is no unrighteousness in God. That means there is no unrighteousness in the Holy Ghost. That means there is no unrighteousness in Jesus. Now you're getting it. Jesus, as it were, is a clean slate of purity, all goodness within him. And we're asking, would he turn water into alcohol? That's why I'm saying once we know the character of Jesus, then we know what he can produce. You ever said to somebody told you something about somebody, you said, that's out of character. And so therefore you can't believe that that person would do that thing. So when you tell me, did Jesus make wine that they're going to get drunk off and party and, and have illicit sex and what? I'm going to say, I will say no. He would not produce something which is going to automatically yield results of sin. Let me carry on. Psalms 100 and verse 5. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalms 34, 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. 1 Timothy 4 and 4. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. You see that? Again, he's saying, it's, for me, it's good. Psalms 86 and 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. That's how good, it is, good he is. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. Black or white, all you got to do is call on him because the goodness of who he is will receive you. First Chronicles 16 and 34, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. I'm just trying to line up the fact that I showed you a picture earlier, an outline of a body saying that's Jesus and he's full of goodness, and now I'm showing you that God is good. Because they are one. Psalms 106, verse 1, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, 
for his love and kindness is everlasting. Hebrews 9, 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater or more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. John 6, 38, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. In other words, Jesus is saying everything that I'm going to do is going to be a reflection of the Father. That means everything that Jesus does, God can say, good. Right? Okay, we continue. John 14 and 31, got a ways to go. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So what you must never miss is that Jesus, the Father, well, and the Holy Spirit are one. They represent each other because they are each other. They are one. This means whatever attribute we give to one, we must also um, give to the other one. Now, there is something that Christians speak, and tonight you'll get it in a fuller way, right? Um, if I say, God is good, you say, if I say all the time, God is good. right, right. Now let's do that like you, somehow, I think you always think it's another story. No, it's, it's, it's the easy thing. If I say, God is good, all the time. All the time. God is good. And so let's understand that. This is the truth. God is good all the time. So everything that he does has the mark of goodness. And because it has the mark of goodness, that means the fruit is also going to be good. Okay, so this is absolutely right. There's no evil, bad, or sin in God. God will not even allow sin or darkness to be in his presence. Remember? Remember even when Jesus was on the cross, he took upon our sins? That's when the Father said, okay, you have become the lamb. And I can't, I have to, I, I can't look upon you. And, and at this point, uh, thank God you know our relationship because we right now are not communicating. And this is powerful. So let me jump ahead and say this. So this means at the wedding at Cana, in Cana of Galilee, God didn't turn his back on Jesus. Jesus gave that which was good. And so the father was right there. Don't tell me the alcohol that's going to start flowing around the island of Bermuda. Oh, in May, especially, May through October, it's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it isn't. So keep that in mind, for it means Jesus is good. The Holy Spirit is good. God is good. Remember, Jesus himself is the living water. Living water. Let me read here Psalms 36, 8 and 9. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. That goes back to what I said in St. John chapter 1, 1 through 5. He is life and he is light. So anytime, you, anytime somebody puts something to you, can we drink this? Can we do this? Is it life and is it light? Can God call it good? And that way you know whether you can do it. What is going to be the fruit of it? Because point to note, when everybody's doing the thing, whatever the thing is, they all think it's good at that moment until the consequences fall out. All right? And so, therefore, that's why you always have to wait for the fruit of the thing. And that's why when God created um, creation in the beginning, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Because you're going to know them by their fruit. So, it's not even just the initial deed. It's the fruit of it. So, you can't say somebody did something once and that makes them good. It good. No, now watch the fruit. Did they just do an action or are they the action themselves? Let's read now Jeremiah 2 and 3. For my people have committed two evils. 
They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that hold no water. An empty life without the living water. John 4 and 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now let's go to the feature task, the feature text. John 2, 1 through 11. I will read it straight through. Here beginneth the reading of God's word. Listen. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, in other words, the drunk. They can't tell what they're drinking anyway. Well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The good wine. Did you see? Did you hear the, um, the host lining up? The good wine. He had never tasted good wine before. He had never tasted wine good like this before. Let me finish off here, verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. I could go into that a little bit deeper, but I'm not, I'm going to push on because really it's saying that once you've tasted of who Jesus is, then you've experienced the glory. The reason that some people come into the church and can be delivered from alcohol is because they tasted of the glory. That's instantaneous. When you really taste the good, you don't want to go back. That's when you're really seeing, I won't go back, can't go back. Because all of a sudden, you have experienced glory. My Lord. So here is the key scripture to attach to this understanding of the question for the night. I love this. This was key. James 3 and 11. Doth a fountain... <laughs> Sand forth at the same place, sweet water and bitter. You can't turn on your tap and get hot and cool. No, you can get warm, but you can't get hot and cool. Whatever, take a look at this, this picture of this fountain I've got here. That's the fountain. So that's Jesus, the fountain of living waters. Okay, so Jesus is the fountain of living waters. Jesus is the fountain of life. So, yeah, so now that fountain can only bring forth who Jesus is. Now, who remembers according to the outline picture? Who, what's in Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus is? So that means everything that Jesus gives out is good. I, I thought about it. You think about it now and later on. Did Jesus ever do something bad? Hmm? He couldn't. He was of his father. God is good. So the fountain Jesus, whatever he speaks forth, is good. Okay, right. You got that? You can only give out what's in you. 
Words are powerful. When we speak, it's the essence of what's inside that you're now bringing out. So don't forget, when Jesus speaks, he is speaking a creative power. I repeat again for emphasis sake. So when he speaks, he's, he's only speaking good. So that means the wine that he produced from water is good. It's something they never had before at the end of the celebration. Now, can the fountain give out good and evil at the same time? No. Jesus can only give out that which he is. Jesus is good, and so he can only give out his goodness. He can only give out his goodness. So if you tell me that was real wine, I mean, it had a degree of alcohol, the stuff that makes you tipsy and all that. No, 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 no. That, that, that's not goodness. I'm going to explain it some more. Okay. Now, remember that God, or oh Jesus, would not permit sin, evil, bad in his presence. Certainly, Jesus would not have sin within him and therefore provide evil at the wedding. No, quite the contrary. They say that it is good. I'll reread that scripture verse. Verse 10. <laughs> and saith unto him, every man, he's been at weddings before. He's been, he, the father of the bride most likely, he has been at plenty of weddings. There's a ritual they have. Their weddings are longer than ours. They last days. <laughs> There's some fermentation that takes place. Over those days, I remember one time I had apple juice. Left it in the car. In the Bermuda sun. Oh, she fermented. Oh, yeah. I smelled that thing. Oh, I rebuked that spirit and dumped it right out. And this is the essence of what is happening over time at the wedding, as the wedding celebration goes on. And so it is the norm, give them the best at the beginning, while they're sh sharp and they're what's sober. Then when they get tipsy, give them anything. Yeah? But here comes Jesus. Jesus provides wine, and they say, hey, this stuff is better than what we had in the beginning. Yes, exactly, because Jesus was in the beginning, and so anything that he will produce will be as he is in the beginning. So he will only produce that which is good. And if you think about it, if we've traveled from the Old Testament and now we're in the New Testament, things have prog progressively um, become tainted, mutated. And so what they are now tasting from Jesus is closer to what was in the beginning. So, of course, they've never tasted of this before. And that's what makes me excited if we understand what we're trying to get people to understand about our Christian walk. That you have not tasted of a relationship of G with Jesus Christ. Because when you do, you will say, this is better than any relationship I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. So, yes, he said, every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. We thought our stuff was good. We put all this money in. We thought we had the good stuff. And when man was well drunk, then that which is worse. You know, you, you, know, you, put the, you, you just know that at the end it's going to get worse. But thou has kept the good one until now. Okay, let's go on. Some things that God brought to my mind as I read and studied the text. All right. So this we're going to need to the camera down a bit. So this is like the picture I got, right? We're at the wedding, Cana of Galilee. And they had run out of wine. Jesus now is going to provide. First he said, his hour has not come. I can't go into it fully. But he was thinking of, it's not time to be crucified yet. That, that's what he meant. The fullness of time. He's like, I've got things to do. I, I, if I show who I am now, they're going to come and kill me. <laughs> anyway, but at the wedding, and um, 
Let me explain the set of prayers. Very simple. And that's the thing about the Bible, you know. It's just very simple once you get it. Now, we've got this picture. Whoa. Ooh, quite heavy. <laughs> Representing Jesus. Now, I said he is full of goodness. Didn't we get that? Jesus is all good. Now, it would be ideally right to keep it clear, but since I want you to see it, I said I better add some food coloring. So just, just so you can see it happening, right? Right. It's right. Oh, ain't that pretty? It's pretty. I like that. Right. Now, this is so simple, you're going to be like, Pastor, why did you even have to show me? This is so simple. There are, and I'll talk about them, there are six water pots. Now, these water pots had actually a particular use. The water pots were for people washing their hands and cleaning up before they ate. It were for no wine. I'll talk about it. I'll read it some in a, in a minute. So I want you to understand that there's a new vessel. These six water pots are empty. And Jesus says, fill them up. Jesus can only fill up a vessel with who he is. So if he is all goodness, guess what? Come hold this for me, deacon, please. <laughs> He is saying, all that I can do is fill each vessel. Oh, glory to Jesus. Say that again. With my goodness. I know this is simple, but jinkums. You know, and I'm, I'm not got it to the brim because, you know, I'm spilling it like this already. But he's saying, you, you can't expect Jesus to do what he is not. And by the way, that's why the world judges us, you know, because we say we're Christians were like Jesus. So, you know, what would Jesus do? Jesus fills containers so, <laughs> so the containers will look like who he is. If these containers look like who he is, that means that these water pots will bring forth fruit. Like who he is. How is it that I'm saying that Jesus would not turn water into wine? Because then you're telling me that the goodness of Jesus poured out something that's evil. It, it's not happening and it did not happen. That was, think about this. The host of this wedding reception tasted of this new wine and immediately sobered up with enough knowledge to say this is better than anything that we've ever had. So a person hallelujah, can walk into the house of God an alcoholic drunk a liar a thief, a fornicator, and if they experience the glory of who Jesus is, the goodness, and become filled, be ye filled, then when they leave, they are now different. They have been what they have never been before. And now when they walk outside and people see them, they now say there's something different about you and they can witness it because the fruit now comes forth. That's why critical thinking here, we have to sometimes ask ourselves, did they really get sad? Was it an emotional moment? Or did they really get sad? See, once you taste, oh glory. Once you taste and see how good he is, I'm, I won't do anything to mess with the goodness of who he is. This thing is so good, I'm not going back. This thing is so good, I only want to now manifest more goodness and show forth my fruit. That I am actually now, watch this, watch this, a manifestation of the fruit of the vine. So that people should be able to taste of my testimony and sober up. 
Did you get that, church? He can only give that which he is. The essence of who he is, goodness. The essence of who he is, love. The essence of who he is, joy. That's what he can give out. All right. I hope you got that. I told you it was simple, but it was wonderful, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. The reason, according to the text, the reason for the water pots is purifying. The reason for the water pots at the wedding is for purifying, washing, making clean. So this is clean wine. <laughs> This is, I termed it, this was mentioned as the purpose to be made pure, purifying, pure. So this is pure water. This is pure water. Pure water is the new wine of the New Testament. Jesus chose to use those pots. Those pots did not have wine in them before. They were ceremonial. Now let me read this from the internet. The water pots are connected <laughs> with a system of law because they were used for ceremonial purification. And what Jesus is saying is, I can't have you satisfied with the law. I can't have you satisfied with doing these outward things. I want you to experience something new and understand that when you experience this new wine, all the outward things just keep a law. They matter little. Mark 7, 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft or often, eat not, heard in the tradition of the elders. <laughs> so while they're getting drunk at the wedding, they're washing their hands. Some of you are going to get that. So while they're doing the outwardly right thing, they're getting drunk. Jesus is not condoning that. That's why he said that, that that's empty. Those water pots are empty. Your traditions are empty. Because you're satisfied to get drunk on this wine. But the wine that Jesus is going to give, it has no alternate purpose other than life and light. Life and light. And if you can tell me that rum is life and light, Oh, I don't mean being life of the party with the lights done. That's not what I mean. When I shared with, la with you last time readings from the Royal Gazette of those who were intoxicated while driving, that's not life. Matter of fact, it causes death. And it's not light. That's shameful. Those people, once they sober up and they stand before court, before the court, they don't feel good about having been caught drunk under the influence, driving while under the influence. So wine and alcohol, these things actually bring about death and darkness. So again, this is why we know Jesus would not turn water into wine because he would not bring about death and darkness. He would bring about light and and life. Now, the water Jesus supplied was the new wine of the new covenant. Therefore, it was better. And this is why they had never tasted it before. How many times am I going to tell you? Once we cross over into the New Testament, Jesus shows up. And so those law-keeping people had never tasted Jesus before. And when they did taste Jesus, they said, this is better than what we had. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Christians say, our walk, our worship is better than being under the law of Moses. Because it's the new wine experience. Because all the rituals don't make a difference. You think, the, you think keeping the law stops fornication and adultery? I wish it did. I've become a law keeper myself. No, no, it's your love and the goodness. Once you become good, the goodness of God keeps you from falling. All right. 
So they got the new wine, new covenant is better than what they had before. You could never have had the new wine because Jesus is the only one that can supply it. The law, Moses, the prophets, they couldn't supply it. Only Jesus could. That's why I say as soon as you mention Jesus, you just crossed over to the new covenant. You are a Christian. I don't care if you worship Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You are a Christian. So this new wine experience, that would not be a lawful washing, but a supplying of a new wine. See, don't focus. This is what Jesus is saying. Don't focus on washing your hands. Focus on receiving something inwardly that will change you forever. Because what happens is, with the outward works, you say, oh, that person, they, they, ain't, they ain't a Christian. They ain't going to see God. But when it's an inward work, you don't worry about the outward work. Because the inner work, you then become a reflection of who Jesus is, which is goodness. Now, let me say this here. Jesus is the new wine, a new ex the new experience. Jesus introduced them to himself. That is why it was the best wine ever. Call it what you want. They could have said, new rum. I don't care what you call it. The point is, if it came from Jesus, it was good. It did not have the same components. How can I say this? Okay, got something else for you. Jesus is eternal. We're going to see Jesus one day, aren't we? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which means the freshness of who Jesus is remains all the time. So Jesus never ferments. <laughs> there is no downgrading with Jesus. There is no degrading with Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so this new wine is the same reflection of who Jesus is. So this is an, a wine that cannot ferment. They could have, now I'm using my spiritual insight based on this teaching. They could have drank that new wine two weeks later, and it would have still been, oh Jesus, it would have still been fresh because there's no decay in what Jesus can give or what Jesus gives. No shadow of turning. No. Now, the only way it would have been bad if, if it, he allowed it to succumb to the elements because now he's divinity walking in flesh. But I'm telling you, the essence of who Jesus is, he never failed. He never did anything evil or bad. Jesus supplied perfect wine. Jesus served wine that they had never tasted before. Jesus served himself <laughs> as a substitute for ceremonial washing. The people who drank and called it the best, did not know that Jesus had used these ceremonial pots. Only the servants knew. Because he's like, when he done, he's like, shh, shh, I've got a lot of stuff to do. Because remember the reason we're dealing with Jews, you do know that, right? Remember, who are the people that said, Hosanna, Hosanna? Say that again. The Jews. Who are the people that said, crucify him, crucify him? Right. So what I'm saying is, is that the Jewish people did not want you messing with the ceremonial stuff. Don't mess with the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Don't mess with their Ten Commandments. So Jesus, he wasn't making this, he wasn't making this a big thing. He's like, oh, Lord, I, I'll tell you now. He remember, he said, mine always not yet come. It's like, I don't need them saying crucify me right now when they see them coming against their ceremony. I hope somebody's getting it. I hope I'm being clear. I'm always concerned about that. Yeah. So he did, he used ceremonial pots, but he never made that part an open show. He made the new wine the open show. So it's not about the ceremony. It's about the contents of who you are. Everything Jesus did on earth was good. Je think I'm going back to the outline. Everything he did was good. Jesus never, 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 never enabled a person to continue in any sin or in any darkness. Right? Let's give some examples here. John 5 and 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Well, we know the story. When Jesus finished, he was all good. Am I right about it? Yeah. <laughs> Mark 1, 23, 24. And there were 
who was in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, and cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And when Jesus finished with this man, he was all good. Matthew 8, 2 and 3. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. In other words, he was now, he was now good. We, I could have shared 44 of these right there. That every time Jesus entered into a situation, when he left the situation, it was always good. He left it better because he's better. He left it good. He left it better because he's the new wine. And he had to introduce them. That's why he did things on the Sabbath day too. He's trying to still tell them, I'm better than that. You're stuck on the day. I'm the Lord. You want to worship the day or you want to worship the Lord? Which one you want? Which one you want? Because if you worship the day, you're going to be worshiping things that are faulty because they failed. Abraham lied. Isaac was, a, you know, they all got issues. But Jesus, the new wine, no issue. All good. Now, Jesus would, Jesus would never supply a sin. Jesus would... Never supply what he was not. I'm just reiterating. He would never give what he is not. <laughs> it makes sense because when he leaves, we have to be witnesses of him. You'd be confused and people say, well, well, he touched me, then I went home, and things just got worse. <laughs> you, who wants to get saved hearing that? <laughs> yeah, I felt good, but then... Next week, God's like, oh, well, guess that's over. What kind of testimony is that? He is all goodness. That's why testimony times, you, I, if you even begin on the dawn, you all bring that testimony up. A testimony testifies of the goodness of God. You can say, I was but God. I was, I felt like, but thank God for Jesus. Because you have to come into alignment with the good of who he is. That's the new wine. Now, he always provided healing and wholeness, miracles, signs, and wonders because that's who he is. That's who he is. No doubt the people at the wedding had attended many weddings. They had tasted of wine at varying intervals, you know, from very good to very bad, from very fresh to very fermented. Yet on that day, it was noted that the wine was better even though it came at the end. They had never tasted anything like it. <laughs> New, New Testament ain't like the Old Testament. Old Testament is a teacher. Love the lessons they're in. But in the New Testament, the teacher shows up. Shows up live and in technicolor. Yes, he does. Jesus gave the best. Jesus gave perfection. Jesus gave from the tree, here we go back, from the tree of life. Good and not evil. Why would a Christian drink of that which is fermented, rotten, and full of evil potential? Why? No, be filled with new wine. That is, be filled with the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. Jesus turned water into wine, but that wine was a wine that had never been tasted before. Therefore, it was not the alcoholic wine that they were using for that celebration. It was new for a new covenant, a new marriage, a new beginning. When you truly are satisfied with Jesus, you do not require anything else to satisfy you. You don't require wine to set the atmosphere. Jesus is the atmosphere. You don't require wine because it goes nice with this meat at the dinner. What? Jesus is better than that. Stop giving power to something that has less power and goodness in it and worship Jesus. Oh, we, will, we in Bermuda would be so much better if we all would stop saying and believing in Bermuda is love to drink. What a contrary spirit. We love to drink. That means we love wasting our money. We love not having enough money. We love not being in charge of our actions. You see, that's the fruit 
That's the fruit. We love leaving our children with the nan and the papa because we're going out partying. That's the fruit. And so more than trying to figure out, stop trying to figure out how you can make it legitimate to, to drink wine. When you experience Jesus, you experience the epitome of goodness. Nothing gooder. Nothing more full of goodness than Jesus. So I say here in conclusion, when you truly are satisfied with Jesus, you do not require anything else to satisfy you. For you have tasted of the best wine and the wine that can never be substituted with anything else. There is no substitute. And the longer that we live, new wines of the world will keep on being substituted. Somebody's going to come up with a new wine, a new label, a new taste, wine tasting. Yet when we taste of Jesus Christ, the things of this earth, oh, they grow strange. It's a strange dimness, strangely dim. Why? Because we're in the light, because he is light and life, in the light of his glory and grace. So the way, to succumb, the way not to succumb to the world's wine is to be full of the new wine, is to be full of who Jesus is. I hope I made the teaching plain tonight. Just remember God is good. Jesus is good. Holy Spirit's good. The fruit is good. It's all good. So if it produces something that's not good, it's not of God. And drink your lemonade this summer. <laughs> Drink watermelon juice. Drink your cold water with ginger and, and all that type of stuff. And experience goodness. That's what we're going to do. So do. If you're tempted, let me tell you something. If you find yourself tempted, the, the, the response to that, love Jesus more. Oh, yeah. When, whenever we, whatever the temptation is, you know. Because the wine of this day is more than that alcoholic wine. Sometimes the wine is a person. The wine is whatever. And the only way to remain focused, you got to love Jesus more than you love this world. And that way, again, those things in the world that many are using to transform their mind and their actions, you don't need that. Because we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. As we have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then you do what Jesus would do. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you people. Uh, certainly we thank God for this teaching. All you need to do is remember the blue water. You remember the blue water, you're going to be good. <laughs> Amen. And certainly those of you that tuned in to Facebook, we want to thank you. Uh, God bless you. And we pray that you can make it down to Shekinah at some time, if you're in Bermuda. And if you are overseas, thank you again for tuning in. God bless you is our prayer.